All right. Um, good morning, selamat pagi. Uh, welcome to Matheson Library. Uh, it's so great to see all familiar faces this morning. Um, uh, today is the fifth session of Monash Indonesian Discussion Series for the year. Um, and today we are going to have and listen um, a talk from Gemma uh, about Real Oz In, Australia Indonesia Short Film Competition and Festival. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Reni, I'm the subject librarian for Indonesian Studies. And for today's session, I've collected some of the um, Indonesian collection that we have related to uh, the uh, theme for today. It's about movies, it's about Indonesian and, uh, Indonesia and Australia relationship. Come and take a look, and if you do want to uh, have a look at the collection, it's on level one, and we can also open up a, another library tour to see the Indonesian special collection on the um, lower ground floor. Um, without further ado, I will be handing it over to Pa Aril, who's going to introduce um, uh, the speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. Let me begin um, our meeting today by acknowledging the people of the Korean nations on whose land we are gathered today. Let me pay my respect to the elders, past and present. Uh, I would welcome you all again to our fifth uh, session. In particular, welcome to Ibu Speaker, Tuduhana Tunewa from the Consul General, and Baba Alphonse. Thanks for coming or making the time. Where's Baba Alphonse now? I saw him earlier. Thank you, uh, Ibu Speaker. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, and I would also like to remind you, just for um, in house uh, keeping house, uh, to switch your telephone to sound mode if you have not done so. so. That would be appreciated. Now let me introduce you very quickly uh, to our very distinguished speaker, Gemma Ferdi. <laughs> She is so special to many of us here, both at professional as well as a social level. I will only highlight a few points from her um, long, beautiful biography. She's the founding director of the Real Ost in Australia Indonesia Shop Film Competition and Festival. Gemma is also the author of many, many books, but I would like just to highlight one of them, and that is the biography of Erfis, why we are gathered here today for, for him. She's the chair of the board that publishes the magazine Inside Indonesia that many of you have subscribed. She co-hosts the podcast Taking Indonesia of the University of Melbourne. Last but not least, she's a member of our advisory board of the Herbfish Centre. Without further ado, Gemma, please, take thank your time. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use this one, I think. Thank you, Ariel, and thank you all for coming this morning and for the invitation to speak at this forum about Real Oz End, which I haven't had actually the opportunity to um, speak about outside of the festival itself. So it's really a nice exercise for me to uh, reflect on the festival, which is, you know, when, when you're organising cultural events, it's kind of always the next, the next thing. Um, but to look back a little bit and to um, t look back at the journey and that where we've been and where we're going. And when I actually submitted this um, idea for this talk to Ariel, it was last year, and at that point in time, we didn't know if we would still be here in 2019 um, for another iteration of the, of the festival. But I'm very pleased to say that we are and that submissions are now open um, for our competition this year. Right, so... My aim today is to share with you some of the background, as I said, to the Real Oz End Australia Indonesia Short Film Festival, now in our fourth year, how it came about, and our development over these past three years. But before that, I'm going to attempt to offer, and I'm very broad sketch, um, really, of the rationale behind it, um, including uh, our position where we were trying to get a sense of or an understanding of the Australia-Indonesia relationship in terms of the way that we feel about each other, our perceptions and attitudes towards each other, levels of familiarity, if you like. So I'll do that first, and then I'm going to offer, again, a very brief overview of where visual storytelling sits as a form of cultural exchange between our two countries. Um, in our bilateral relationship, so visual storytelling in particular. 
So it's often said that there are no two neighbouring countries that are more different than Indonesia and Australia. And indeed, you know, we're all aware of the many differences, including economic ones, language, religion and so on. And in analysis of, analyses of the ups and downs in the government-to-government -government relationship, these dis differences are pointed to as potential flashpoints. But to counter this narrative of cultural and historical separateness, researchers, including some of you in this room, and I include myself in this, have pointed to myriad and often long established connections between the two countries, including from pre-colonial links between the first Australians and Makassan traders, for example, and to more contemporary history, including Australia's support for Indonesian <coughs> independence after the Second World War, the pioneering volunteer graduates, and so on. These are stories of connection and shared histories across our borders and cultures, which we know to be important and formative in the relationship between the two countries. And over the years, although it's been in stops and starts often, as you are also very aware, Australian government policy has promoted various programs of cultural exchange, student exchange, language teaching, arts exchange, and so on. And we know that tourism and education links connect our countries like never before. And yet, the reality is that our reservoir of popular knowledge about Indonesia in Australia, and vice versa, remains shallow and is out of step with the emphasis consistently placed on the importance of the bilateral relationship by both countries, but by Australia in particular, I think. As McRae and Lindsay point out in the introduction to their book here featured, Strangers Next Door, in an effort to bridge difference and engage more successfully between Australia and Indonesia, quote, much has been done already, has off, sorry, much that can be done has already been attempted, often with some success, but these efforts need to be scaled up dramatically if they're to have real impact, end quote. And whilst I don't want to labour the point, it is worthwhile reminding ourselves of what the data shows us. The data in particular from surveys and polls, asking precisely how we feel about each other as Australians and Indonesians. And they continue to tell us, um, as you know, perhaps you're very familiar with the Lowy polls, you know that they regularly tell us that a third of Australians don't know that Bali's part of Indonesia. Yeah? In the latest Lowy poll, which was, um, there's probably a new one due to come out actually, 50% of respondents did not agree that Indonesia is a democracy. 24% agreed, so that's good, 24%. But, <laughs> however, that, that number was lower than the previous year, so that some 3% changed their mind. Okay. Also, on the Lowy thermometer, which you can see there, which rates, asks uh, respondents to rate countries by feel, right? So if you're hot about the country, then they get, you know, in the 90s. If you're cold, they're down towards the bottom. And pretty consistently, um, Indonesia comes in around 54 degrees, which is pretty lukewarm, I'd say. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is if you look, and it's hard to see, I think, um, about the other countries that rate above Indonesia, right? So we've got China, India, uh, Papua New Guinea, South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, etc. Other Asian countries that rate above Indonesia on that on that thermometer. Okay. So of course, there's a lot of uh, problems with. Uh, well, we can be quite critical of polls and how they're put together and the limitations, etc. But I think that given that this is a const consistent um, finding from these kinds of polls, it does give us pause to think. There's one more graph, which is the table here, which is, you know, somewhat in contrast, and we're trying to kind of understand what, <laughs> some of this. At the same time, around a million Australians visit Indonesia every year, mostly to Bali. Um, I don't know if you noticed, you heard recently that the outgoing head of World Vision, Tim Costello, was quite critical of the Australian middle class recently when he was leaving his job, saying that, you know, 
for whatever reasons, he, you know, there's not so much money being donated these days to charities. And he said, because Australians think it's their human right to go to Bali once a year for a holiday. <laughs> okay, so that's how ubiquitous the Bali holiday is in these middle class Australian consciousness, I guess. This is a lot of Australians visiting every Indonesia every year, and it's a figure that's risen 546% over the 10 years to 2016. So only increasing. And if you reflect on the political ups and downs, maybe, that have gone on in the bilateral relationship in that period of time, it's quite interesting. <clears throat> Moreover, historical analyses by Agnieszka Sobaczynska, a scholar here at, Mel at Monash, of decades of attitudinal polling tells us exactly this, that all the diplomatic ups and downs in the bilateral relationship, even, you know, even with a democratising Indonesia, have negligible impact on how the Australian public feels overall about Indonesia. So these perceptions here indicated in a 2018 survey of lukewarm uh, responses have been constant for decades. Now, there's plenty of opinions on why this is so, including from within our own field of scholarship. I don't think Howard Dick is alone um, in blaming Australian, Australians' Anglophone intellectual laziness. Um, and like Herb Feith, David Walker points to our parochialism and our inward-looking nature and underlying it all anxiety. Moreover, there's also varying views on whether Australia's general ignorance about Indonesia necessarily leads to negative views of it. Okay, so there's some that believe there is this correlation. But Diane, Dave McRae and Diane Zhang argue in their close investigation of such a link that it doesn't actually bear, bear up in, in the face of evidence. Ignorance does not necessarily mean being ill-disposed, right, and vice versa. Indeed, as John Legg pointed out four decades ago this year, actually, in a conference that was held in Canberra on Australia-Indonesia relations at the peak of New Order authoritarianism, he made the comment that it's also possible to imagine the opposite, that is, that the more the Australian public knows about their neighbour, the more likely they are to think badly of it. In the context of an authoritarian regime or of rising uh, Islamic terrorism targeting foreigners, for example, the potential, you know, we can understand is undoubtedly there. Regardless, what remains constant is, as I was saying, this relative antipathy of the Australian public towards Indonesia compared to other Asian countries, actually, including China. Indeed, what I think is more interesting is that if we look across surveys done of Australians, we see that familiarity with Indonesia remains far below our familiarity with Japanese, with Korean, with Chinese cultures, for example. Australians struggle to name an aspect of Indonesian culture, uh, literature even, cuisine, or to recognise a national figure. I think that that's fairly much the case. But, again, we might pause to acknowledge that Australia's lack of knowledge of Indonesia is not something that we alone are guilty of, right? Um, you might have read this quote before from the businessman James Riadi, quoted by Elizabeth Pisani in a piece she wrote for The Guardian, where he made the point that Indonesia is the biggest invisible thing on the planet. So we're not the only ones that aren't recognising the fabulous potential or the fabulousness of Indonesia. On the Indonesian side, in the past decade, polling of attitudes, their attitudes towards Australia, reveals a somewhat dark contrast to the Australian responses. Indonesians have in fact largely positive attitudes towards Australia based on aspirations related to education and lifestyle. As far, uh, and of course far less Indonesians have in country experiences such as tourism and education and work opportunities to draw on for their reference. So perhaps we can just assume that the perception of Australia that they have, this very positive idea, is attained through media, perhaps some other inference, and that plays a part. But actually, we don't really know why this is the case. Why do Indonesians think so well of us? And I would love to have uh, more research at hand to, to illustrate this to you. Ariel and his colleagues in Indonesia have 
actually completed some AIC funded research, which is identifying spaces where there is an opportunity to close this gap, I think, to build this familiarity, um, to find meeting points for exchange and so on, especially among young people. And I think, you know, we hope to build on that. In her assessment of the often unpredictable bilateral relationship, UE researcher Evi Fitriani pointed out that perhaps this was in part due to, indeed, a lack of the type of social and cultural interaction that could provide space for a relationship of familiarity and mutual understanding. I was really drawn to her phrasing, and as you can see, I actually used it in the title of my talk. For most of us, this general argument that knowledge and familiarity will cause a shift in perceptions continues to be compelling especially in the context of a democratic and economically strengthening <coughs> Indonesia. Indeed, this is the premise underlying the Australian government's policy of engagement with Indonesia and with the region more broadly. We also know that an increasing number of Australians, as I mentioned, have in-country experiences as tourists in, in Indonesia, but also educational opportunities which are made possible by the government-funded new Colombo plan. These policies and pathways to engagement are based on the premise that close connections through first-hand experience and interpersonal relationships will break down misunderstandings. The NCP is administered and funded by DFAT, not by a Ministry for Education, which is really interesting. And it describes it as a signature initiative within its wider public diplomacy strategy. At the end of 2018, the program had funded some 31,000 undergraduate students travelling to 40 countries in the Indo-Pacific, and it had a forward budget of over $50 million a year. Indonesia has received the highest number of NCP students, and our ambassador, Gary Quinlan, describes it as a critical element of the bilateral relationship and confidently appraised it recently, or I think it was a few months ago now, as creating an enduring connection with our nearest neighbour. As Agnieszka Sobczynska and I have written elsewhere, thanks to Megan Ariel, positive as the outcomes of these programs may be in and of themselves, yeah, for the students involved, for the hosts um, in Indonesia, they are in the end available to only a tiny number of Australians. So I think it is a little bit too early to judge its long-term success in relation <coughs> to the NCP's broader goals for our foreign policy and indeed the impact of such a policy on overall shifts in the attitudes or levels of understanding um, of Australians about Indonesia and vice versa. So until, at, at this time, really, it can only be limited. That all said, the question, therefore, remains for government, I think, and for us too, what types of social and cultural inter, inter, interaction might have a broader impact? Okay, in the late, uh, in about late 2013, early 2014, so not long after the AIC was founded, um, the centre was looking for ways for programs and initiatives actually towards doing that, to finding these spaces for interaction. Um, early on it was decided that the focus of any such activities should be on a mutuality, yeah, of shared interests and shared challenges. And no new ideas here, on storytelling as a medium for building familiarity, okay? We could see that the work was there. There was still work to be done to fill the knowledge void, if you like, with stories and connections that encourage relatability, respect, mutual struggle and challenges, that kind of thing. And the exchange of stories through cultural forms like film, literature, art and performance is, of course, a compelling aspect of the bilateral relationship where so much has already been done, but you can always do so much more. Okay, as many of you know better than me, over the years, governments, community groups, diaspora groups have engaged in countless projects and wonderful exchanges towards this very end in the arts, in culture, literature, film. And whilst enthusiasm is never lacking, Roadblocks are there, um, including funding, um, sometimes it's language capacity, and that kind of thing. And I'll leave it to Barbara Hatley to write that, that history and that story. I'm sure she can do. 
But we wondered at the AIC, in the digital age of online streaming, you know, of YouTube, what was being done in terms of exchange through visual storytelling or stories on film, if you like. Okay. So, just a note here as well. What follows is very much a crude survey, um, far from a full historical account of uh, visual storytelling in the Australian Indonesia context. To do that, I'd need to traverse far more territory than I've got time to do today, including, importantly, um, noting the contribution and significance of Joris Ivans and his seminal film, Indonesia Calling, which Ariel has written about, and the work of individual filmmakers in Australia and Indonesia um, in this bilateral relationship, <coughs> like uh, John Darling, about whom I'll say more in a minute. But today my focus is really just to offer like a brief overview, a brief survey of contemporary representations of each other's stories on screens to get a sense of where we stand, like what actually has been, has been screened, um, what might be missing. Another caveat I'd offer is, the reluctant, is, is to remind everyone um, of the reluctance of every, any nation really to incorporate non-local or foreign content on television in particular, um, uh, and to some extent also in terms of film. But of course, digital streaming is changing our viewing habits and offering up far greater choices. Okay. So Indonesian stories on Australian screens, and I guess I'm really looking at the last, say, four decades, my lifetime, if you like. Um, but yeah, the last 40, 50 years, the representation of Indonesian stories on Australia's small screens, well, on television, has really been non-existent. The exceptions to this are, of course, not news media um, and the occasional documentary, including those by the Australian filmmaker John Darling, whom I mentioned. As former Fairfax foreign correspondent to, uh, to Indonesia, Michael Bachelard, has pointed out, in relative terms, Australia has maintained actually a fairly significant presence in Jakarta in terms of media coverage, yeah? We've had a foreign correspondent there pretty much permanently for a very long time for the ABC and occasionally for um, other networks. Nonetheless, as foreign correspondents will also tell you, their brief rarely allows for more nuanced content or coverage of social issues or stories where there's no direct Australian interest. Indeed, other TV content featuring Indonesia in some way similarly tends to relate to or have an angle that is about Australians in Indonesia, whereby Indonesia's backdrop for Australian stories of us what behaving badly, holidaying, falling in love, that kind of thing. Um, for example, you might all be familiar with um, that uh, in May 2014, the first episode of Channel 7's reality TV series, What Really Happens in Bali, had a million viewers, and it's said to have led to a spike in Australian tourists to Bali. So that might explain that 546% increase. <laughs> and the extremely popular series of commercials for Amy Insurance featuring, featuring Rhonda and Couture, it's lovely, we love it, um, is used as an exemplary case study for marketing and advertising students, right? But again, this is an Aussie story in an Indonesian setting. Although it's a beautiful representation of an Indonesian man. <laughs> Thank them for that. Um, now, you'll also currently find the critically acclaimed Marlena Murderer in Four Acts streaming on SBS Movies On Demand, which is fantastic. And digital streaming really is, you know, maybe where the future is. It offers so many new opportunities um, and new ways of watching and reaching um, audiences globally. It's had a positive impact on the diversity of screen production, what's out there. The good news is, is that Indonesian directors are collaborating with, you know, the big platforms like Netflix and HBO Asia to create content. Um, Joko Anwar's produced a, a kind of a horror series um, of TV shows called Half Worlds, which is set in Jakarta, for example. And that is also available on SBS On Demand, so I'm advertising for them today. <laughs> But when it comes to films, I think it's fair to say, and Meg can correct me, um, that over recent decades, Indonesian films have very much appeared on Australian screens, or have rarely, sorry, appeared on Australian screens outside of a festival setting. Okay, so international film festivals, our biggies in Australia, MIF, and sorry, the Melbourne International Film Festival and the Sydney Film Festival, have featured 
Indonesian films over the past 50 years, but not in large numbers. And those selected for festivals have been dominated by a handful of Indonesian filmmakers in that time. For example, between 1952 and 2017, 47 Indonesian films, so almost one a year, um, but that includes features and shorts, have screened at MIF. And, but of these, half, well, by just seven filmmakers, and you can probably guess who they are. One of them has seven films himself on that list. Um, and hopefully we'll have another one in this year's festival. The place of Indonesian films in this program is, you know, pretty inconsistent. Um, and, you know, we can see that, you know, it's influenced by various factors. For example, um, Australian government funding in 2017 saw an Indonesian shorts program featured in MIF and they also screened the critically acclaimed Malina, which was fresh from Khan um, in 2017, but last year there were no Indonesian films at all and so far, as much as I've seen of the 2019 program, so far no Indonesian films, but I do hope that there will be the Garin Nagroho film um, added to it eventually. So given all of that, you would all be familiar with the Indonesian Film Festival, which is held in Melbourne annually and is celebrating its 14th iteration this year. It kind of makes us uh, appreciate how important actually this festival is for bringing Indonesian films and their creators to our city, at least our city, in Australia. The festival features popular mainstream and also more festival type films in a program of around six films. The audiences are always good, um, made up largely of the Indonesian diaspora, including large numbers of Indonesian students. The non-Indonesian or non-Indonesian speaking component of that audience is, by contrast, very small. Another one-off initiative uh, offered this year was the DFAT-funded Indonesian stream in the Breath of Fresh Air Tasmania Film Festival held last month. Again, the films featured were by filmmakers familiar to Australian festival audiences, um, Garin Negroha and Camilla Andini, but again, a, a good, good development. Of course, as you, know, you all know, Indonesian films have long been used also extensively in Indonesian language teaching curricula in Australian schools and universities, and this was largely made possible due to significant work that, done by uh, David Hannan and by Bas Kuzasi to subtitle films over many years, and so we have this incredible um, stockpile of these films available to us. Okay, so that's the Indonesian stories on Australian screens. Australian story, stories on Indonesian screens, how does that look? Well, okay, I had to ask a friend of mine for a little bit of anecdotal uh, accounts here, so feel free in question time to contribute your own. Um, my friend Gaston Sahadi, who's a Monash um, alumni, gave me a few accounts of his memories of Aussie stories on Australian TV, and he came up with a few mini-series that were screened in the 80s and 90s, like The Flying Doctors and Return to Eden, um, A Town Called Alice, I think, also. But he couldn't really think of any more, more recently than that. Um, and we know that Australia TV, so essentially um, ABC content, is available, but again, available for an English-speaking audience, um, which is you know, not, not entirely popular. It's interesting to note, um, I think here, that to make a note about Indonesian cinema and how it's in a boom period at the moment, huge growth in terms of ticket sales and also numbers of screens opening up, right? So something like um, in, uh, in 2015, um, about 6 million, um, the audience was around 6 million, and by 2017, it was over 42 million. And this is in large part due to a deregulation of the industry, which is allowing for foreign firms to have more of a stake in the industry and, um, and they are indeed um, opening new screens and Indonesia's middle class are loving the experience of going to the cinema. So that, that's interesting, film is booming, but what are they watching? Well you won't be surprised to hear that distribution of Australian made films is extremely limited outside festival settings, same as here. The Australian Embassy initiated the Festival Cinema Australia in 2015 with screenings initially in Jakarta, but this year it also travelled to major cities in Java, Bali, and it went to Makassar. 
Attendance to this festival is free um, and it's open to the public. But again, the audience is largely made up of Aussie expats and alumni of Australian educational institutions and invited guests of the embassy. Another uh, place where you might see uh, is it Australian stories on Indonesian screens? Question mark. Is the trend um, in Indonesian film that Meg was talking about actually last time about the use of foreign locations? Um, and Australian settings have been used in a couple of recent um, movies that you might have seen. One of them is Melbourne Rewind, another one is Love in Perth. But these stories are made by Indonesians for an Indonesian audience. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be set somewhere else. So it's questionable whether they're Australian stories. So, one point here is that clearly the Australian government is actually very keen to see more accomplished in this space, right? Some kind of collaborative um, projects, particularly around film, um, and they've actually been offering some of these small kinds of um, incentives and grants, and recently there was one in conjunction with Screen West, which was um, to encourage collaborative filmmaking. And I guess one of the maybe ultimate expressions of you know what you might call bi-national, bi-cultural um, film um, making is this co-production where you get films made by you know by Australian and Indonesian filmmakers together. And interestingly, in the only just the last year or two, there have been two films which are co-productions, and there's really not much before that. Um, one of them is called Message Man, the other is Seven Angels. You might have be familiar with Seven Angels, which was filmed here in Victoria and really, you know, launched here. So there is potential to increase this kind of cooperation and collaboration between our filmmakers, um, and perhaps in ways comparable to the cooperation being driven between, say, Australia and China's film industries at the moment. There's a lot of emphasis um, being driven by government, but also industry, um, towards finding complementarities of technical skills, locations, that kind of thing in film. And we know too that on the Indonesian side there is, there is um, uh, an interest, that there is maybe uh, a, you know, a gap here. Um, in late, uh, late last year, the Finance Minister Sri Mulyani, you know, she's, she's been doing a lot of talking about you know, the importance of offering vocational training for, um, for Indonesians in various um, parts of the economy, including the creative economy, and she has spoken in particular about the film industry and you know, how, how there should be more investments in that. So again, potentially for Australia, there's, there's some um, room there for complementarity and skills training and working together. But I guess, as you can see, until now, Indonesians and Australians are just not being given the opportunity to see each other's stories on screen, large or small. So outside of the classroom or outside of the festival setting, just really, it's not in the mainstream um, of what we've been experiencing on screen. One more observation before I get on to Rila's end, I couldn't uh, resist this one, is to show you these tables of box office data from Indonesia and Australia in this week in January. And if you can read it, you can see that there is certainly one thing we do love that we share. We, we share this great love um, as two countries, which is American film, American cinema. We're not alone in that. But you can see in this uh, week in January that you know the top five films in both countries were American blockbusters. So we share that. OK, so real Oz end. Well, really, it was through my involvement with the Herb Feast Foundation's John Darling Fellowships um, for Indonesian and Australian filmmakers that I guess I was, you know, aware of the path forged by filmmakers like John, um, for example, in, in you know, the relationship between our two countries. And it was initially through discussions with the network, with the network of Darling Fellows um, that, that we had, and also some Aussie filmmakers with an interest in Indonesia that our ideas began to crystallise around, you know, real Ozind. We wanted to find a way to build on these long established connections through the arts, including film, between the countries. Um, and we wanted the emphasis to be on creating binational, a binational cultural space where both Australians and Indonesians showcase their storytelling in the one forum, the one festival. So not kind of separate as is normally the case. 
Real Ozend is a short film competition and festival. It's held both online and in screening events, held across both countries in partnership with community and educational organisations. The competition's open to films of up to 10 minutes in length from genres of documentary, animation and fiction. And we give special awards for best young filmmaker, so those aged 13 to 18 years. And my favourite, for best collaboration between Indonesian and Australian filmmakers. We decided on a short film competition and festival because of the desire to find a different approach, I guess, with potential to include, but also reach beyond the existing, I don't know, bicultural consumers, yeah? So the existing audience that was there for receiving Indonesian um, arts performance or Australian arts performance in, in both settings and find these, these new audiences and share these stories with them. We wanted to find an accessible and popular storytelling form that connected with people in both countries, especially young people. Right? Short film seemed obvious, actually, given what we knew about the burgeoning and excellent scene um, of emerging filmmakers in, in Indonesia who were having really great success internationally at, um, in recent years, and of course, you know, we, we know about Australia's long love affair with short film, uh, thanks to Tropfest and other major festivals over the past couple of decades. We also wanted to find something that was technically and financially viable, cheapish, actually. There was money initially to see fund, but um, that has declined, and so, um, you know, it needs, needs to be uh, financially viable until now. And we wanted it to be accessible to filmmakers and audiences wherever. Right? So they didn't just have to come to us, but we wanted to be able to go to them. So we also decided to go with a competition um, theme to ensure that the festival was kept fresh each year, right? to provide it with a shared foundation too for the kinds of stories that were being told. Um, we especially liked the idea that filmmakers would respond to a common theme as a point of comparison, of difference, of similarity right? for audiences to respond to, you know, walk out of there and, and to contemplate. So far, the festival has seen some wonderfully diverse collections of films responding to our themes. I'll say about that, more about that in a moment. But this quote is from our frequently asked questions list on our website. Um, and it's kind of, this is exactly, you know, we're not, it's not a film festival for Australians who already know a lot about Indonesia or have interactions with them. We love them and they can make films for us about their experiences, but it's not just for them. So this is where, you know, we have to kind of encourage Aussies who've never had anything to do with Indonesia to, um, to get involved. And so this is, you know, tell us your stories, you know, whatever, if it's set in Indonesia, if it's set in Australia, if it involves um, a cross-cultural aspect, that's fine. So, yeah, we just kind of want to represent, um, be inclusive of that. So, in the last three years, we've um, had, uh, our themes have been, in the first year we had Tatanga, neighbor, we had air, water, and then last year we had muda, muda, youth. This year our theme is baruba, change. Okay, so another priority that we had when we started out was that we wanted to be able to guarantee, well, we wanted to attract quality film, um, and so for that we wanted to be able to guarantee good prizes and a quality jewelry, right? Um, and we were really lucky and we had these fabulous um, filmmakers like Mira Lesmana and Riri Rira. Um, we had um, a very well-known TV um, writer Tom Gleisner, producer Andrew Mason. So, you know, we wanted some heft and gravitas on our jewellery. So in the first year, you know, it was kind of down to us and we, we hosted festivals, yeah? We worked with our partners and we, we put these festivals together, the screenings, and we, we did all of that ourselves. And we were drawing on our existing networks in film um, and also in educational institutions. And you know, I'll say here, um, Ibel Speaker, that really it was, uh, for me, it was like, where do I go, who do I know? And it was the Australian uh, Awards Alumni Network in Indonesia. <laughs> in all those educational institutions which was, you know, put to work as it were and we're really happy to, to be involved. But in our second year, we, I guess we were really responding to the enthusiasm that we, we got in the first year from, from hosting partners um, and we, we decided to go with a pop-up festival model 
um, which is much more grassroots -led, roots led um, actually. And because of the incredible ease of you know the technology, the digital technology, it meant that we realised we can just share our materials with anyone, anywhere, and um, encourage them to host screenings. And so that's kind of how it's gone from there. If someone's got a projector and a wall or a screen and they've got a few people together, they can host one of our festival screenings. It's a pop-up screening. And there can be conversation and just a good time. That's, that's great. We love that. So each year we've seen our festival, um, I think this is the next slide, um, grow. And I've got, there's a little, some diagrammy things there um, that tell you a few of the stats about us. Um, but really last year, you know, we had pop-up screenings in about more than 30 places. So that included our kind of big events, which were held in Jakarta and <coughs> Melbourne, but also all of these other smaller and um, spontaneous events um, in places which, you know, what's exciting is that they take place in places that where these kinds of cultural exchanges might not otherwise happen um, because, you know, Australia, the Australian government or the Indonesian government haven't got there yet. And uh, so, for example, last year we had pop-ups in regional Australia, places like Bigger and Cairns and Newcastle, um, and in Indonesia, places like uh, Palankaraya, in Jember, in Chiamis, okay? Now, mostly our partners are kind of film society groups, um, and also, as I mentioned, educational institutions like <coughs> schools. Pasantren have been involved, as well as universities. Um, and so it's really diverse. And another thing is that it's really bilingual, you know. So that, that's one of the um, interesting things about, about the festival is its bilingual nature. So that's a challenge for us, actually, when it comes down to um, identifying our key challenges. Um, they are the language thing, subtitling, and the other one is around classifications. So, uh, but they, you know, they're not insurmountable or, or difficult, but you know, we're aware of them and we really, really um, want to be a bilingual festival in everything. So all of our materials, website content, um, and of course the films themselves must be bilingual. And I, I remember way back in the first year when we had a little committee um, working on, you know, just putting together this whole thing, the ideas for it, and we talked about subtitles and about who would be responsible for them. And it was Jacinta who said, oh, you have to just make the filmmaker responsible for the subtitling. And we all had great doubts about Australians ever being able to do such a thing, and especially for Indonesia. That has been borne out, actually, but um, occasionally you get Aussies trying, not very well. But Indonesians <laughs> always, always step up and will provide some si subtitling to their films. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's average, but, you know, that's the difference, actually, that we know about in between our two <laughs> cultures and countries uh, when it comes to language. And um, we want to kind of get Aussies um, shifting a little bit on that to recognise that they need to, to do more and... Uh, to be heard, they have to have subtitles in another language. So yeah, our challenges, as I said, are, um, so that, that's the one, the subtitling. The other one is classifications. And so, you know, we have to be kind of careful and it's very clear in our guidelines that um, these films are, should be available for um, 15 and under, yeah? F kids 15 and under to view the film. So it's kind of like a G, maybe a PG rating. That's in the Australian context, the Indonesian is context is a little bit different, a little bit um, less black and white, perhaps. But um, you know we're guided by our um, advisory committee and by our jury, and we seem to come out okay on that score um, uh, until now. That that's been the case. So you know they're kind of the things. I mean, I will also say that um, pop up festival hosts, um, you know, they're very um, we're very happy for them to adapt the content. Right? So, for example, you know, a school, um, particularly this Pasantran that we have been regularly screening um, at, you know, they may, there may be a couple of films in there that, you know, they don't want to screen and that's perfectly fine and that, that's, you know, that's down to their um, judgment and but that, that's something that we allow for because we've kind of got that flexible format. Um, so another thing that's interesting about us, I think, is because we're, uh, because we are a competition, right? So we're not really curated, not really, because as long as 
uh, the requirements of the guide, you know, the guideline requirements are fulfilled by the filmmaker, um, it, and also the narrative, the content of the film is in keeping with the theme that we've set for that year. Um, it's really down to our jury members to make their assessments of the films based on all of those parameters, but just on their, you know, how they feel about the films. And so, um, you know, that's something that is perhaps a little bit different because we don't have that level of control so much of content. But um, again, that's also what makes it exciting, I think. So, real as end. I think that the key achievements across these three years is undoubtedly the production of such a high quality short film festival. And it really, it is. Like we work with really great post-production. Um, you know, we, we showcase the films at ACME. We have, we have, we present it, you know, in, as best as we can um, because we want to honor the wonderful work of the filmmakers and of the audiences that come along, yeah, our live audiences and also our online audiences. And so I think there's pride in the fact that the competition you know, has included a list of esteemed jury members um, from Indonesian and Australian film industries and critics, and that it's supported emerging filmmakers in both countries awarding significant cash prizes. But just as significantly, I think, is that at the heart of Real Ozind, um, as it's evolving, is this growing network of screening partners in locations, as I said, which are far and wide, and um, where Australia-Indonesia kind of um, interactions not necessarily have happened yet or might otherwise reach. Um, so it's kind of a new ground. Our pop-up screening model means that in practical terms anyone can host. Um, and we have had so many events, you know, in cafes, classrooms, lecture theatres, community halls, that kind of thing. This slide's just giving you an example of last year's winners um, for the various categories and, you know, the quality was, you know, really blew your mind last year um, of the films that were submitted. So what I think happens within this, at the fest, during the festival, which runs for many months, so it's a bioscope kaliling is what we call it, you know, and then it kind of adopted the pop-up factor, um, is that your results in a largely intangible but affecting shared experience that comes from watching films in a live festival setting. You know, that's, that's something pretty special. But on top of that, um, there's access uh, to the short films via the online festival and our social media pr um, program. And we're reaching, you know, audiences far broader than that. We are entered into a partnership with an online um, well, it's actually a short film platform called Vidzi, which is Singapore-based, and you know they're all about promoting particularly Southeast Asian or regional film, and they approached us about uh, working with us to host a channel for Real Ozind on, on their website, which we've done and developed, and it's really exciting. And they said, we thought, why haven't we got Australian content on, on our platform? And so that, that's happening too. So that's an even broader audience um, that is seeing Australian and uh, Indonesian films. And the other significant achievement, um, and to kind of close, um, is about facilitating connections between the filmmakers themselves. You know, this is not something that we have budget to do. Um, we can't send people to places, but it's kind of, you know, how people are these days. They get in touch somehow, and, you know, relationships form. Um, and so we've got this lovely example um, that's come about where uh, a filmmaker from Jogjakarta who was winner of our best film in 2016 and again in 2017, because he's just awesome, Derry Prananda, and Australian filmmakers um, Tim Barreto and Melanie Filler, who were finalists in our documentary category in 2017, found each other, you know, through whatever, and um, together they travelled to Palu after the tsunami and have made a film and documented that photographically as well and, you know, are talking about other collaborative works together. So, you know, that, that's excellent. That's tangible um, from, from, you know, from, as a consequence of what we do. But I think, I guess, it's more about this kind of thing where you know that there's groups getting together around the screen um, and they're watching the films and it's stuff that they may never have um, contemplated before and it's Australia and Indonesia in the same place on the same kind of topics and it, you know, stimulates conversation. And that's what we're about. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, when I look at what um, 
Shema is done with real arms. I always imagine a goddess with a thousand hands, you know, just doing so many different things. Mm -hmm. And this is only one of like 10 or 20 things that she's been doing all this time. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Gemma. But let me just say a few couple of things that is relation to what um, Gemma just said. Number one, um, the center, the Herpes Center, continues to support the John Darling Fellowship for Australian filmmakers, documentary go to Indonesia and work with Indonesian counterparts. Uh, this is an initiative that also Gemma initiated earlier. Thanks so much for that. Uh, then I also would like to share a rather sad story. Thank you, Buspika. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ma. This, this, year, this year is the 70th anniversary of the world recognition of Indonesia independence. Not much has been happening to celebrate this. Is. I met with one guy, a filmmaker from Australia, by the name of Graham Isaac, who had intended to make a series for SBS to celebrate this. And Graham, by the way, if you have not met him, Graham is the son of Joe Isaac. Who visited? He, Joe, was one of the very first, one of two Australians sent by the government of Australia to meet in person President Sukarno and Hatta and others to show support to congratulate them. No other foreigners from the Allied Forces have done that. And they did that in defiance to the Allied Forces trying to reoccupy Indonesia on behalf of the Dutch, actually. Now, he wanted to make a film of that. And in a time, to, he, he needed a sponsor. So he approached me because he saw me uh, talking about the period of the 70s. Mm -hmm. I talk about the period in uh, Universal Indonesia. Somebody put it on YouTube. And now that, that video has been viewed by 120,000 people. So it was very excited about that history. Mm -hmm. And nobody celebrated this year. It's so sad. Now, I've been talking to uh, the governor of uh, Australia in Jakarta. Uh, Ambassador uh, Gary Quinlan, whom I will meet again next week, uh, he showed support. And he said, Tibet might want to support their filmmakers. But we need some private companies to also support. We can't just do it from government. It's like government propaganda. Mm -hmm. You can understand. Mm -hmm. But no private company support that. So Tibet cannot support a lot. It's so sad. Mm -hmm. So I think the project now you know, disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. Mm -hmm. So, but this is something that is so important because Indonesia gained its world recognition thanks to Australia fighting for four years in the world, in the United Nations, representing Indonesia on the request of the Indonesian government. It's not celebrated at all, on screen or otherwise. It's so sad. So with that, uh, I'd like to open the discussion now to you. If you have any comments or questions, please do so. Yes, Ed. 